Every smile hides a secret, and some of them are deadly. Welcome to Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi. Featuring retired FBI special agent and chief of the Counterintelligence Behavioral Analysis Program, Robin Dreek. Sandra Birchmore, Karen Reed. It's a case that uh, shares a lot in common, a lot of officers in common. Uh, obviously, a lot of questions in the Karen Reed case about accountability, about cover-up, about possibly planting evidence about protecting the blue. Sandra Birchmore, also a case that uh, has a lot of those same issues in it, protecting uh, and incompetence or purposeful cover-up. Um, the disturbing part about both these cases is it involves a lot of the exact same people. And when that happens, we start to see kind of a, a behavior arc. We see consistencies. We see a pattern of behavior. Joining me to discuss, Robin Drake, retired FBI special agent, chief of the counterintelligence behavioral analysis program. I got this uh, in a text uh, on our Instagram account from a listener, and I, I, I wanted to make sure it was completely accurate. So I did my digging, and I, I went through to make sure that what was said in this, this text um, was in fact true. And I'm just going to read it uh, here uh, to you. The first officer on the scene at John O'Keefe's death was Officer Lank, who said he heard Karen Reed say she hit him, but he's the one who also did not put it in his report. And the first officer on the scene at Sandra Birchmore's death was also Officer Lank, because Sandra was from Stoughton, but lived in Canton at that point. The second officer was Kevin Elbert, Brian Elbert's brother, the state trooper who investigated Sandra Birchmore's death this is a big one. Trooper Fanning, who was Trooper Proctor's boss. You know, we all know what's going on with Trooper Proctor. And, you know, if you're thinking, you know, it comes from the top down, I got some questions about Mr. Fanning uh, and what he knew about what Proctor was up to. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of stunning. Um, some of these key people in both of these cases uh, in key positions where if one wanted to make a cover up or hide something, uh, those would be some key places to do it. Uh, same medical examiner uh, as well in both cases. Uh, it's, yeah, and everybody's the beginning. Oh, they're, they're different. They are different cases. They both deserve their own attention, but what the hell is going on here where you have all of these issues? Birchmore groomed from the age of 12 by these two officers, um, sexually assaulted at young ages, uh, eventually ends up pregnant and then dead shortly thereafter. This is a long time coming. Um, what's your thoughts on, on all this? It feels like far more than just a coincidence. Yeah, striking, but I'm not surprised. At the very beginning of us covering the Karen Reed case, I was really struck, talking about striking, by the reaction of the community. You know, we've talked about this before, too. You have behavior arcs of people, you have behavior arcs of groups, you have behavior arcs of areas, towns, cities, nation states. Everything's a behavior arc because they're data points of what normal behavior looks like every day, day in, day out, of what we can reasonably expect to happen every day. When we have a major deviation from what normally happens and what we expect to happen, something caused it. A lot of these things that cause these things are very subliminal. We can't really consciously understand them, but they happen. In this case, the, the public outcry that we saw in support of Karen Reed, to me, was extremely striking to a lot of people. They're very passionate about this, very anti-cop in this area, more so than even though we have a very anti-law enforcement agenda that's kind of been flitzing around the country, kind yeah. of ebbing right now. But this one was really up there, really ramped up there. And it was all around what we saw, these improprieties that we saw being mentioned during the case, and we saw some weirdness with the evidence collection and statements being made and the drunkenness involved. And so it was it kind of made sense as to why the, you had a public outcry. But then we have this case pop up, and it just adds even more data points that fuels that fire of there is a deep-rooted wrongness going on in that department that the community was picking up on. And what I mean by that, in Gavin DeBecker's book, you know, The Gift of Fear, he talks about red flags. Human beings, we recognize red flags every day. They're the feelings we get that something's just a little off, or mm -hmm. we get a little creepy feeling from someone. And what it is, is as human beings, we're very, very observant. We're not consciously aware how observant we are, but we can note, I mean, just think about this, Tony, when you when and if you ever went into the office like I did, you knew when someone was having a bad day without mm -hmm. even saving a word because right. something was a little bit off. Their tempo was a little off. Their 
their their face something just a little bit different that day. You can tell when someone's having either a really good day or a really bad day because we're picking up on subliminal body language. Well, whole areas of countries do that too, towns. And so when you have those kind of red flags, those nonverbal red flags, those little statements here, little statements there, these little red flags or grains of sand, eventually they add up to a beach. And a beach means that something either is really good or really bad. In this case, we have really, really bad because we have lots of red flags that caused a fire. This smoke caused a fire. And I think the fire is this entire department in the region. They got a big problem. And the, the thing is, the this whole cornucopia of of insanity uh that that's going on there it's it's th these are the big cases these are the some of the big ones that they felt they could play a role in in allegedly covering up most of the stuff they deal with are not anywhere near to the level of murder and things of that nature those are you know they happen but you know they're they're few and far between compared in volume to the amount of cases that they deal with I can only imagine that a lot of those vibes probably came from much smaller cases where they can tip their hand on this scale and tip their hand on that scale. And nobody's going to be the wiser and nobody's going to have the means or the energy to really pursue it other than just going, yeah, well, it's they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, but then it goes to this level. And then people are like, oh, they really are going to do what they're going to do. Yeah, and those little things you're talking about are the everyday things that we all see around us when we interact with law enforcement, whether it's going into a coffee shop and maybe a sense of entitlement they might have had when they either cut a line, got a free uh, coffee with a strong arm maybe or an insinuation, a car stop for something that was inane, stupid, or not even real. Uh, in other words, what they probably saw, again, conjecture here, yeah. is – Little data points of overuse of power, overuse of control, which we've talked about so often on our show. And when you see little data points of, of these exertions, they really grate at you. They really annoy you because what they're saying is they're saying as an institution, which is supposed to be all about serving and protecting. Remember the key word serving means that you don't think yourself better than anyone else. You're not putting yourself in a position of power or authority. You're there to serve the public trust. You're there to serve liberty and justice for all. But when you're exercising that level of superiority, of betterness, of me looking down my nose at you and treating you like less, that's where these red flags are, and that's where the smoke starts, and, we, and it manifests in the large cases. But you're right. I wonder how long it's been going on and simmering below there so that the final public outcry on the Karen Reed case, and now this case as well, uh, was going on. Well, it's disturbing as it takes a lot of people to cover something like this up because you have so many people involved in an investigation. And somewhere along the line, there's a few that are going to have to somewhat accept that they're going to tip the scales. Uh, they may not know the full extent of what's going on, but they know enough to know that this is wrong and what this person is doing is very wrong. The level of the only other level of insulation I can think of like this that we've seen recently is the Diddy case, where those within his level of insulation just enabled it. And that's what apparently that's what it feels like is happening here within these departments, where it's like we got this level of insulation, nobody can touch us. And that's I think what, what blows the mind more. It doesn't blow my mind that there's a, a child predator out there on a police department. Or they're they're all over the place. Um what blows my mind is that there's other people within that department who I'm hoping are not child predators, but are willing to go the extra mile for that person that evidence points that they probably are. And you're going to protect them just because you both wear a badge. Well, and we saw it when we we're talking about the Diddy case. I mean, what was the main motivation for the protection? Fear. Yeah. Fear is the greatest motivator there is. Yeah. When you fear for your livelihood, when you fear for your prosperity, when you fear for your professional reputation, it's going to impact your ability to provide for your family. It's a powerful motivator. Yeah. And so who knows what other kind of motivators they had in there, but fear is prevalent. And I got a feeling that that's exactly what's going on here. You had the, their blue wall was all about fear. Uh, we've and there was I wish I could remember the exact case, but there was a big blue um they called the blue wall in the NYPD many many <laughs> decades ago. Yeah. Um, whether it still exists, you know I don't think so. I, I know a lot of people there now, but you know there was a big blue wall and there was one guy, one cop that stood up against it, and he was railroaded hard, like life death threats. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, a 
landmark case that they used in that um, in that example to bring down that blue wall. But did he leave the country? I think you've talked about that case before, where like he literally like left the country because the threats got so bad. Yeah, I think he did. And I, actually, it's probably it's a com it's a common case. I guarantee you. Uh, I know you got a lawyer on your show too. I, he probably brought it up because it's a it's one of those landmark cases. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. It's it's just I don't know. I, again. I'm not shocked that there's bad people in in good positions, uh, but when you have good people protecting the bad people, that's what we have far too much of going on. It feels like right now. Yeah, and and so it's incumbent, and I agree with you know people calling for outside uh, investigations on this. And the first thing you got to do is, and that's why um, one of the first protections you give when you're given interviews is you give immunity because immunity is what a lifting of the fear. Yeah. And so you need people to be able to come in there as outside investigators who are the loving critics and lift the veil of fear so that the good ones can start flapping their gums and bring the light of day in here. Because without it, there will never be trust again. No, no trust. Uh, the l rule of law falls apart. All right. True crime addicts, let's cut the crap. You're knee deep in the gory details of your favorite podcast when suddenly a commercial hits like a bad meal. Seriously? You deserve better. Upgrade to True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts, where you can binge without those annoying ads. Plus, get extended interviews that go deeper into the darkness and early access to episodes so you can be the first to know. It's like trading up from fast food to fine dining, but with more blood. So, go ahead. Search for True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe and feast on the good stuff.